All right, so this is my reading of the Kalevala, a uh, compilation of Finnish epic poetry put together by Elias Lonrot. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that properly, uh, in the 19th century. So it's uh, a very interesting book. It is quite dense. So we will start with uh, chapter one titled In the Beginning. Um, as this chapter gets off, I just want you to kind of envision almost sitting around a campfire, you know, sitting amongst a group of people where there's a central storyteller. Uh, I think that image will help with the uh, lengthy introduction of this piece. In the beginning, I have a good mind, take into my head to start off singing, begin reciting, reeling off a tale of kin and singing a tale of kind. The words unfreeze in my mouth, and the phrases are tumbling. Upon my tongue they scramble, along my teeth they scatter. Brother dear, little brother, fair one who grew up with me, start off now singing with me, begin reciting with me. Since we have got together, since we have come from two ways, we seldom get together and meet each other on these poor borders, the luckless lands of the north. Let's strike hand to hand, fingers into finger gaps, that we may sing some good things, set some of the best things forth, for those darling ones to hear, for those with a mind to know. Among the youngsters rising, among the people growing, those words we have got, tales we have kindled, from old Vinamoinen's belt, up from Ilmarinen's forge, from the tip of Farmine's brand, from the path of Jokahainen's bow, from the north's furthest fields, from the heaths of Kalevala. My father used to sing them as he cut an axe handle. My mother taught them, turning her distaff, and I a child on the floor, fidgeting before her knee, a milk-bearded scamp, a curd-mouthed toddler. The Sampo did not lack words, nor did Lohi spells. The Sampo grew old with words, and Lohi was lost with spells. And with tales Vipunin died, and Lemminkainen with games. There are yet other words, too, and mysteries learned, snatched from the roadside, plucked from the heather, torn from the brushwood, tugged from the saplings, rubbed from a grass head, ripped from a footpath, as I went herding, as a child in the pastures, on the honey-sweet hummocks on the golden knolls, following black buttercup beside Bouncy the Brindled. The cold tale told to me. The rain suggested poems. Another tale the winds brought. The sea's billows drove. The birds added words. The treetops phrases. I wound them into a ball and arranged them in a coil, slipped the ball into my sled and the coil into my sledge, I took it home in the sled, in the sledge towards the kiln, put it up in the shed loft in a little copper box. Long my tail's been in the cold, for ages has lain hidden. Shall I take the tails out of the cold, scoop the songs out of the frost, bring my little box indoors? The casket to the seat end, under the famous roof beam, under the fair roof? Shall I open the word chest and unlock the box of tails? Unwind the top of the ball, untie the knot of the coil. I will sing quite a good tale, quite a fair one I'll beat out, after some rye bread and some barley beer. If beer is not brought and ale not offered, I'll sing from a leaner mouth, after water I will lilt, to cheer this evening of ours, to honor the famous day, or to amuse the morrow, and to start the new morning. I heard it recited thus. I knew how the tale was made. With us the nights come alone, the days dawn alone. So was Vinamoinen born alone. The eternal bard appeared from the woman who bore him, from heir daughter, his mother. There was, alas, an heir girl, a nice nature daughter. She long remained holy, forever girlish, in the air's long yards, on its level grounds. Her times grew weary, and her life felt strange from being always alone, living as a lass in the air's long yards, in the empty wastes. 
So now she steps further down, launched herself upon the waves, on the clear high seas, upon the open expanse. There came a great gust of wind from the east, nasty weather, lashed the sea to foam, whipped it into waves. The wind lulled the maid, and the billow drove the lass about the blue main and the froth-capped waves, and the wind blew her womb full, and the sea makes her fat. She bore a hard womb, a difficult bellyful, seven hundred years, nine ages of man, but no birth was born. No creature was created. The lass rolled as the water mother. She swims east, swims west, swims northwest and south, swims all the skylines in fiery birth pangs, in hard belly woes, but no birth was born. No creature was created. She weeps and whimpers. She uttered a word, spoke thus, Woe, luckless me, for my days, poor child, for my way of life, now I have come to something, forever under the sky, by the wind to be lulled, by billows driven, on these wide waters, upon these vast waves. Better t'would have been to live as lass of the air, than just now to toss about as water mother. It is chilly for me to be here, woeful for me to shiver, in billows for me to dwell, in the water to wallow. O oh, old man! Chief God, upholder of all the sky, come here when you are needed, come this way when you are called, free a wench from a tight spot, a woman from belly throes, come quickly, arrive promptly, most promptly, where the need is. A little time passed, a moment sped by. Came a scop, straightforward bird, and it flaps about, in search of a nesting place, working out somewhere to live. It flew east, flew west, flew northwest and south, but it finds no room, not even the worst spot where it might build its nest, take up residence. It glides, it hovers, it thinks, considers. Shall I build my cabin on the wind, my dwelling on the billows? The wind will fell the cabin, the billow will bear off my dwelling. So then the water mother, the water mother, air lass, raised her knee out of the sea, her shoulder blade from the wave, for the scop a nesting place, sweet land to live on. The scop, pretty bird, glides and hovers, it spied the water mother's knee on the bluish main, thought it was a grass hummock, a clump of fresh sward, it flutters, it glides, and it lands on the kneecap, there it builds its nest, laid its golden eggs, six eggs were of gold, an iron egg, the seventh. It began to hatch the eggs, to warm the kneecap. It hatched one day, it hatched two, soon it hatched a third as well. At that the water mother, the water mother, air lass, feels that she is catching fire, that her skin is smoldering. She thought her knee was ablaze, all her sinews were melting. And she jerked her knee, and she shook her limbs. The eggs rolled in the water, sink into the sea's billow. The eggs smashed to bits, broke into pieces. The eggs don't fall in the mud, the fragments in the water. The bits changed into good things, the pieces into fair things. An egg's lower half became Mother Earth below. An egg's upper half became Heaven above. The upper half that was yoke became the sun for shining. The upper half that was white became the moon for gleaming. What in an egg was mottled became the stars in the sky. What in an egg was blackish became the clouds of the air. The ages go on, the years beyond that, as the new sun shines, as the new moon gleams. Still, the water mother swims, the water mother, air lass. On those mild waters, on the misty waves, before her the slack water, and behind her the clear sky. Now in the ninth year, in the tenth summer, she raised her head from the sea. She lifts up her pole. She began her creation, forming her creatures on the clear high seas, upon the open expanse. Where she turned her hand around, there she arranged the headlands. Where her foot touched the bottom, there she dug out the fish troughs. Where else she bubbled, there she hollowed out the depths. 
she turned her side to the land, there she brought forth the smooth shores. She turned her feet to the land, there she formed the salmon haunts. With her head she reached the land, there she shaped the bays. Then she swam further from land, paused upon the main, formed the crags in the water, grew the hidden reefs to be places for shipwreck, the dispatch of sailors' heads. Now the islands were arranged and the crags formed in the sea, the sky pillars set upright, the lands and mainlands called up, patterns cut upon the rocks, lines drawn on the cliffs. But still Vinamoinen was not born, nor fledged the eternal bard. Steady old Vinamoinen went round in his mother's womb for thirty summers and as many winters too, on those mild waters on the misty waves. He thinks, considers, how to be, which way to live in his dark hideout, in his narrow dwelling where he has never seen the moon, nor beheld the sun. He says with this word, he spoke with this speech, Moon, unloose, and sun set free, and great bear, still guide a man out from the strange doors, from the foreign gates, from these little nests and narrow dwellings. Bring the traveler to land, man's child into the open, to look at the moon in heaven, to admire the sun, observe the great bear, and study the stars. When the moon did not loose him, nor did the sun set him free, all his times felt strange, his life felt irksome. He shifted the stronghold gate with his ring finger, slid the lock of bone with his left toe, came with his nails from the threshold, with his knees from the doorway. Then he tripped head first seaward, hands first he tumbled waveward. The man stays in the sea's care, the fellow in the billows. He lolled there five years, both five years and six, seven years and eight. He stood on the main at last, on a headland with no name, on a mainland with no trees. With his knees he tensed upward, with his arms pulled himself round. He rose to look at the moon, to admire the sun, observe the great bear, and study the stars. That was Voinamoinen's birth. How the bold bard came to be from the woman who bore him, from heir daughter, his mother.